Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. So um, today we're going to be focusing on interpreting information, in particular the text-based questions. So I feel the database questions can be easier, you know, it's just about kind of interpreting the bar chart or pie chart or whatever kind of graph is in front of you. But with um, these kind of text questions, I think there is more of a logic that you can kind of apply to them. And I'm going to talk you through some of the important ideas that I believe um, are necessary to be able to excel in this area. OK, so first thing to mention is about the keywords and synonyms, obviously. So the one thing they love in interpretation is using synonyms. OK, and um, that's it basically means that when you're looking out for words in statements, you have to ensure that you're trying to use a word that's appropriate. OK, I'll get on to what that means in terms of which keywords to look out for. Obviously, you want to try and avoid words that have um, that can easily be changed or interchanged. So something like happy or you know like simple common adjectives can easily be switched around in passages whereas pro things like proper nouns or harder words that don't really have um similar definitions don't that don't really have synonyms those are kind of better to look for as keywords okay it's also important to remember some of the definitions so especially in some of the medfi questions you know remember the the basic definitions that we have from syllogisms for last time so you know your sums your most your not alls i can just repeat them here really quickly if you want so sum is 2 to 99 not all is 1 to 99 most is 51 to 99 um and then we've got um few which is less than 49 okay the reason why this is important is for example in the text if it mentions that there is one town where there is um, an active fishing community then you can't say some towns have active fishing communities okay cool the other thing is watch out for some of the definitive statements so obviously um, it's, it's statements that are more definitive so things when it says like this is that or this will be that or this will lead to that they generally tend to um, require more kind of information from the text because you have to be able to conclude it definitively remember and remember the definitions for yes and no are exactly the same in interpreting information as they are in syllogisms and um so if you're a bit unfamiliar about what they are perhaps you can go back and check out uh, my syllogisms video on the arrow method um and hopefully that should clear things up the other thing that I think is also really important is something I call sentence memory, which is like just roughly remembering what was happening in each line or sentence. And the reason being is so that when you get onto the later statements, then you know exactly where to head to. OK, but I'll talk you through exactly how I do questions um, and um, it will make more sense in a bit. The other thing that's important is to recognise that there are differences between verbal reasoning and interpreting information. Um, while they may seem like the same thing, with interpreting information, you're given a little bit more of a leeway. OK, in order to infer things. OK, they have to be appropriate inferences. And once again, it'll make more sense in the walkthrough. But there definitely is more of a leeway present um, than you might see in some other kind of um, in VR text. OK, and, and on that point, there's just one thing that I want to illustrate, which is Medify normally do a wonderful job. Right. Um, so although the questions are great, but I think with VR, uh, sorry, with interpreting information, this is one of the places where they're perhaps lacking a little bit because I feel they don't really make room for as many inferences as you might see on the official UCAT question bank, which is why I recommend every, every single student of mine or any student at all, if when you're practicing for the UCAT, it's really, really imperative that you do at least all of the questions on the official UCAT question bank. OK, the reason being because those are the ones that are going to be most accurate and most representative. OK, and for that reason, um, it's really, really important that you... Um, uh, kind of get a proper proper feel of what they're like because unfortunately it's weird because the interpreting information ones on the official UCAT question back I feel like have slightly less slightly more inferences whereas the um the ones on Medify are perhaps a little bit more akin to syllogisms kind of um not completely but um what I mean by akin to syllogisms is in terms of how much inference you have to make okay it'll make more sense as as we come on to this next question so with these questions, what I always like to do is I always like to read the first line of the passage. And what that allows me to do is it gives me just a rough idea of what the passage is about so I know whether I want to continue or not. Because remember what I said, there's a really, really big kind of emphasis on exam techniques in terms of which questions you answer. It's not like you have to answer every single question immediately on your first run through. OK, obviously, like I said, the syllogisms and interpreting information, because they are two mark questions, you probably will have to answer them at some point. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to answer them all first. OK, 
And so normally I like to do some of the easy ones. Sometimes there's more challenging ones, you know, there may be ones that are just look too complicated or the subject matter is a little bit out of my depth or I like I know nothing about it. So here I would say the increasingly, I would read the increasingly contrasting argument over the safety and genetically modified crop shows no signs of receding. Okay, so now I've got my key idea. I know what it's roughly about, genetically modified crops. Now I go to the statements. So the first one says the debate on genetically modified crops has been reconciled. So I'm lucky with this one because it's actually in the first line. So it says the increasingly contrasting argument shows no signs of receding. So therefore, this is going to be no. Does that make sense? However, this isn't necessarily always the case, and it's important to remember this. And if I hadn't got the answer, all I would do is I would continue reading from here, and I would continue reading until I found my relevant point. Okay, so I've got the answer to the first statement. Now I read my second statement. And remember, every single time as well, when I go past a sentence, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to remember roughly what the statement was about. So the first one is about the debate on genetically modified crops. The second statement says the advantages of genetically modified crops clearly outweigh their risks. Okay, so I mentioned about kind of some words, for example. So here, the key idea is the word clearly. So kind of the important idea here is sometimes words are going to be very definitive. So here clearly is a very, very definitive word. So that means we have to clearly be able to say that the advantages are better than the risks. Okay, so that there's no leeway here. Okay, so let's have a, have a look here. So it says, remember, one, one second, what I said about synonyms, if you look ahead in this passage, it doesn't say advantages anywhere, but you just kind of have to bear it in mind. So advocates hold them to be safer since they're produced using fewer pesticides, herbicides and fertilizers. Okay, so that line talks about pest control agents. In the developing world, grappling with the great problem of malnutrition, genetically modified crops can have vitamins and minerals added to them to provide great nutritive benefit to people who rely on a single safe food. So that talks about nutrition and proponents emphasize their ability to augment agricultural production and dress associated climatic fluctuations, something like the climate. And finally, it says critics, however, claim that their benefits do little to compensate for their reals. So, Bearing in mind all of these ideas, a lot of people here sometimes put yes, because they think, oh, more advantages are stated. But the problem here is you can't clearly say the advantages are with the risks. Do you see? Because it says their benefits do little to compensate for their ills. So this statement is going to be no. OK, so third question. Genetically modified crops are more tolerant to droughts than traditional crops. So this is where we kind of separate a little bit from verbal reasoning, because if you have a look here, it doesn't mention the word droughts anywhere in the text. OK, but remember, we do re remember reading something about climate. So let's go to that line. So proponents emphasize their ability to augment agricultural production address risks associated with climatic fluctuations. So a drought is a climatic fluctuation. But in VR, this answer would be can't tell, because how do we know they're talking about droughts and not other climatic fluctuations like, you know, thunderstorms or heavy rainfall or tornadoes, or, you know, hurricanes, whatever, whatever. And the reason is, is just because the people who design the exam are like this. They, there's a certain, it's kind of like a game and you, have to, you just have to learn to play the game, okay? So in this section, you're allowed to make inferences, okay? But they have to be relevant. So because a drought is a climatic fluctuation, you can say yes to this because it says, it allows them to address risks associated with climatic fluctuations. So therefore they're gonna be more tolerant to these climatic fluctuations, such as droughts. In verbal reasoning, like I said, I, it would have been a can't tell because you do, they haven't specified the word droughts. Once again, I understand this is annoying, but it's one of those where you just kind of have to learn to go with it. Um, and, you know, this is just how they've designed the questions to be. The next one. So as compared to genetically mod, and just one thing to raise on that point. So this is what I was saying, the difference about um, with this and Medify with the official UCAT question. So all of the questions I use in any one of my videos, um, unless explicitly stated or if you can see from a screenshot, um, will be from the official UCAT question bank. OK, so all the ones I've done so far are all from the official UK question bank. But the ones on Medify, I feel, don't get you to make as much of inferences. Um, and that's why I said they were more like syllogisms, not because you use the technique or because they're syllogisms, but because syllogisms is more direct. Right. You can't really make inferences. You can't reach out as such. OK, which is why it's annoying and which is why I would really recommend you guys try and do the interpreting information on the official um, UK website. And you'll kind of get a feel for what I mean about kind of what level of um, inference you can make. OK, so fourth statement, as compared to genetically modified crops, traditional crops use more pest control agents. So I remember reading that in this line over here. So a lot of people here see the fewer and the more and they immediately jump to putting no, because that's fewer, that's more. But if you read it carefully, it says advocates hold them to be safer, talking about genetically modified crops, since they're produced using fewer pesticides. And here it says, as compared to genetically modified crops, traditional crops use more pest control agents. So this is actually saying the same thing, but from opposite sides. OK, so this is saying the same thing but from opposite sides. So this is actually true. And finally, people who primarily consume rice can get greater nourishment for gently modified rice than traditional rice. So I know what you're probably thinking now, and perhaps you've clocked onto the idea now. It doesn't say rice anywhere, 
But where do we read when we're reading about the nourishment idea? Well, this sentence. So in the developing world, grappling with a grave problem of malnutrition, genetically modified crops can have vitamins and minerals added to them to provide greater nutritive benefit to people who rely on a single staple food. You can probably see where I'm going with this. If someone primarily consumes rice, that is a single staple food. So therefore, you can once again make that inference. But it ha the inference has to be relevant. So for example, if it said people who consume I don't know, avocado on toast, then that would be wrong because that's not a single staple food. Do you get what I mean? So it has to be a relevant enough inference. Okay, so just to kind of wrap things up, I guess, and summarize. So I always read the first sentence first. This again, I read the passage and I go through the statements and you just kind of keep reading until you get your answer, essentially. And then you stop, go to the next statement. Obviously, you'll probably finish reading the whole paragraph before you get through all your statements. So then it's just a case of that memory. Okay, and with interpreting information, obviously, it's not too bad if you don't remember, because obviously it's not like VR and there's just a massive chunk of text. So you can just look a little bit. I mean, you can always just go back and, and read it. But ideally, your memory should be good enough so that for the later questions, you know exactly where to head to. OK, and then that and that's, I think, a really, really important idea. Um, yeah, so that, that that's pretty much it. And then obviously, remember, look out for keywords, look out for synonyms and try to choose appropriate kind of keywords, I guess, here. Um, the things that you're kind of keeping in your mind. So like the debate has been reconciled. Obviously, there's no point in looking for just the word debate. You kind of have to think around it. OK, but each time you're kind of keeping one kind of statement in mind until you get there, then you switch to the next one, then you switch to the next one, switch to the next one, and so on and so on and so on. And remember, think about the inference and how much you're allowed to reach out, essentially. OK, great. So on to the second question then. So if you guys would like to have a go at this question, um, if you maybe you can pause, maybe you can put your answers down in the comments below and then we can um, I'll talk you through it. OK. Great, so let's have a go at this. So unlike a company's ongoing operations, which are aimed at managing ongoing repetitive processes, a project is directed towards a particular outcome with a beginning and a clear end, okay? So a project is aimed at delivering a specific result. Well, you can see, it's, I think it's kind of comical sometimes the way that they like to do these, um, like to do the, the synonyms. So direct, directed towards a particular outcome, delivering a specific result. So I'd say this is true. The new age manager has a more diversified job portfolio. Once again, manager is probably a safer word to go for than something like new age, which can be switched out. So think about something to do with managers. We're bearing that in mind. So with the beginning and a clear end, this does not mean that project's duration is short. In more recent times, managers. So once again, I think it's quite comical the way that they do these things. New age in more recent times. Managers, other than performing routine work, find themselves managing both the process and service aspects of a project, okay? Though a distinct set of skills is required for each role, a manager donning two hats definitely needs to learn to multitask. I would say yes, because it says they manage both the process and service, and it says they need to learn to multitask, okay? Business processes that extend indefinitely can only be part of ongoing operations. Well, we remember reading what ongoing operations at the top, and what does it say? Unlike a company's ongoing operations, which are aimed at managing ongoing repetitive processes, a project is directed towards a particular outcome with a beginning and an end. So it tells us a project has a beginning and an end, but these ongoing operations are just ongoing repetitive processes. So if something extends indefinitely, it doesn't have a beginning, uh, sorry, it doesn't have an end. So therefore, it's not going to be a project, and so therefore it must be an ongoing operation. A manufacturing unit producing 200 mobile phones each day represents an ongoing operation. OK, so this is one of those where they they've given you the information and you won't find this in a text, but they're getting you to apply our knowledge of ongoing operation. Well, what do we know about that? It's an ongoing repetitive process. 200 mobile phones a day sounds like an ongoing repetitive process to me. So I would agree with this one. And the last one, the redesign of a mobile handset by a mobile company is part of ongoing operations. Well, if you're redesigning something, the start is the old phone that you have and the end is going to be the new phone. So I would say that this isn't an ongoing repetitive process because you don't keep constantly redesigning it. You make one redesign, right? And then you call it there and then that'll be the new phone and then you'll redesign that later on as well. So I would say this is, no, this is going to be a project because this does have a beginning and an end. Okay, so this is what I would put for this question. And once again, any of the questions that I do, you can always check out on the official UCAT question bank for yourselves. Um, and you can read some of their more in-depth explanations if you would like. Okay. So, third and last question. Once again, if you guys would like to take a pause, see if you can do this one, um, and we will kind of go from there. Okay. So, no water in any tropical ocean is as biologically diverse as in this region. So, upwelling makes the ocean water more fertile. So here, I don't really know what the word upwelling was the first time I read this passage, and 
in a way, that's fine, because you can probably guess roughly what it means, okay, because it's talking about the water and stuff. But the point that I want to make here is, remember what I said, try and choose words that's really hard for them to find synonyms for when we're looking for keywords. So upwelling is probably what I'm going to bear in mind when I'm looking for this, okay? Um, but then obviously the more fertile idea, I'm going to keep at the back of my mind as well. So as a local response of the ocean to surface wind, the warmer nutrient depleted, so this is perhaps referring to the fertile bit, surface water is replaced by the dense upwelling water that rises to take its place. So if the upwelling water replaces the nutrient depleted water, it must make it more fertile, right? So I'm going to agree with this. Phytoplankton is a food source for some marine animal species. Once again, what did I say? Proper nouns, you can't really change them, right? So phytoplankton is probably going to be quite a good bet to keep as a key idea, and then something about food source and something about animals, okay? So the speculation about the association of cooler waters with the enhanced growth of phytoplankton gained ground when the chemical analysis confirmed of the water from the west coast of the region confirmed a high concentration of dissolved gases along with nutrients like nitrates, phosphates, and silicates. Phytoplankton uses the light harvesting pigment chlorophyll and forms the base of several aquatic food webs. So I would agree with this one because it forms the base of several aquatic food webs and a food web is like one, one animal eats another animal which eats another animal. So I would agree with this. So we finished the passage with a passage now. So tropical western coast may not be a good region for fishing. So once again, this is where the memory comes in. I remember seeing it here. So let's read around that sentence. So normally, okay. So the speculation about the association of cooler waters with the enhanced growth of phytoplankton gained ground when the chemical analysis from the western coast confirmed a high concentration of dissolved gases along with nutrients. And also remember there's the enhanced growth from earlier. So it tells you that there is a high concentration of dissolved gases as well as nutrients and a lot of phytoplankton which are known to be you know, the base of several aquatic food webs. So overall, I would say no for this because it's probably likely to be a good region for fishing because you've got a lot of basically prey that other fish can eat, okay, as well as good nutrients and gases, etc., etc. Warm water is pushed away from the surface over limited marine zone. So this is a question that can sometimes trick people because they're a bit confused about this aspect. But I remember reading something about warmer water earlier. So let's read from the start of this sentence. As a local response of the ocean... Do you see? Once again, I think it's quite comical. So local response of the ocean, limited marine zones. As a local response of the ocean to the surface wind, the warmer nutrient depleted surface water is replaced by the dense upwelling water. So warmer water is pushed away from the surface. I would agree because the warmer surface water is replaced. Okay, so I'd say this is true. And lastly, the abundance of phytoplankton in the region is directly related to temperature. So once again, we've got quite a definitive thing here, directly related. So the whole idea of um, something about phytoplankton temperature was here. So the speculation about the association of cooler waters with the enhanced growth of phytoplankton. So this is a speculation currently, okay? Um, and it says, again, ground on the chemical analysis, confirmed high concentration of dissolved gas along with nutrients like nitrates, phosphate, and silicates. So because it's a speculation, we can't say for sure, okay? Because it's simply a speculation. It doesn't give us any more idea. If it said maybe related, then you could put true. Because it could be true. It's true that it could be true. But because it says directly, we can't conclude that for certain. Okay, so once again, with interpreting information, like I said, there's no kind of, it's not a clear cut method. This is just the way that I like to do it. Take a sentence by sentence. Some people like to read the whole passage. That's fine. I wouldn't really recommend it um, because you don't really have a direction as to what you're looking out for. And I think it's probably one of the more efficient ways to do it. But there are other interpreting information questions as well, which I think are important to understand, um, which I will also go through um, in a, another video. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. Uh, so thank you very much um, for watching. I hope it was helpful. And as always, please do comment down below any queries, if there's anything that you don't understand or if there's anything else that you'd like me to cover. Um, I'm just trying to get through decision making as quickly as possible. And then we will move on to some of the other sections.